Section 17 of Reminiscences and Table Talk of Samuel Rogers. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Lord Seaforth, who was born deaf and dumb, was to dine one day with Lord Melville. Just before the time of the company's arrival, Lady Melville sent into the drawing room a lady of her acquaintance who could talk with her fingers to dumb people that she might receive Lord Seaforth. Presently Lord Guildford entered the room, and the lady, taking him for Lord Seaforth, began to ply her fingers very nimbly. Lord Guildford did the same, and they had been carrying on a conversation in this manner for about ten minutes, when Lady Melville joined them. Her female friend immediately said, Well, I've been talking away to this dumb man. Dumb? cried Lord Guildford. Bless me, I thought you were dumb. I told this story, which is perfectly true, to Matthews, and he said that he could make excellent use of it at one of his evening entertainments, but I know not if he ever did. A friend of mine in Portland Place has a wife who inflicts upon him every season two or three immense evening parties. At one of those parties he was standing in a very forlorn condition, leaning against the chimney-piece, when a gentleman coming up to him said, Sir, as neither of us is acquainted with any of the people here, I think we had best go home. One of the books which I never tire reading is Memoir sur la vie de Jean Racine by his son. When I was living in the temple, the chimneys of one of my neighbours were to be swept. Up went two boys and at the end of an hour they had not come down again. Two other boys were then sent up, and up they remained also. The master of the boys was now summoned, who on his arrival exclaimed, Oh, the idle little rascals! They're playing at all fours on the top of the chimney. And to be sure, there they were, trumping it away at their ease. I suppose spades were their favourite cards. Neither Moore nor myself had ever seen Byron when it was settled that he should dine at my house to meet Moore. Nor was he known by sight to Campbell, who, happening to call upon me that morning, consented to join the party. I thought it best that I alone should be in the drawing-room when Byron entered it, and Moore and Campbell accordingly withdrew. Soon after his arrival they returned, and I introduced them to him severally naming them as Adam named the beasts. When we sat down to dinner, I asked Byron if he would take soup. No, he never took soup. Would he take some fish? No, he never took fish. Presently I asked if he would eat some mutton. No, he never ate mutton. I then asked if he would take a glass of wine. No, he never tasted wine. It was now necessary to inquire what he did eat and drink, and the answer was nothing but hard biscuit and soda water. Unfortunately, neither hard biscuits nor soda water were at hand, and he dined upon potatoes bruised down on his plate and drenched with vinegar. My guests stayed till very late, discussing the merits of Walter Scott and Joanna Bailey. Some days after, meeting Hobhouse, I said to him, How long will Lord Byron persevere in his present diet? He replied, Just as long as you continue to notice it. I did not then know what I now know to be a fact, that Byron, after leaving my house, had gone to a club in St. James's Street and eaten a hearty meat supper. Byron sent me Child Harold in the printed sheets before it was published, and I read it to my sister. This, I said, in spite of all its beauty, will never please the public. They will dislike the querulous, repining tone that pervades it, and the dissolute character of the hero. But I quickly found that I was mistaken. The genius which the poem exhibited, the youth, the rank of the author, his romantic wanderings in Greece, these combined to make the world stark mad about Child Harold and Byron. 
I knew two old maids in Buckinghamshire who used to cry over the passage about Harold's, quote, laughing dames that long had fed his youthful appetite, etc. After Byron had become the rage, I was frequently amused at the manoeuvres of certain noble ladies to get acquainted with him by means of me. For instance, I would receive a note from Lady Blank, requesting the pleasure of my company on a particular evening with a postscript. Pray, could you not contrive to bring Lord Byron with you? Once at a great party given by Lady Jersey, Mrs. Sheridan ran up to me and said, do as a favour try if you can place lord byron beside me at supper byron had prodigious facility of composition he was fond of suppers and used often to sup at my house and eat heartily for he had then given up the hard biscuit and soda water diet after going home he would throw off sixty or eighty verses which he would send to the press next morning he one evening took me to the green room of Drury Lane Theatre, where I was much entertained. When the play began, I went round to the front of the house, and desired the box-keeper to show me into Lord Byron's box. I had been there for about a minute, thinking myself quite alone, when suddenly Byron and Miss Boyce, the actress, emerged from a dark corner. In those days, at least, Byron had no readiness of reply in conversation. If you happened to let fall any observation which offended him, he would say nothing at the time, but the offence would lie rankling in his mind, and perhaps a fortnight after he would suddenly come out with some very cutting remarks upon you, giving them as his deliberate opinions, the results of his experience of your character. Several women were in love with Byron, but none so violently as Lady Caroline Lamb. She absolutely besieged him. He showed me the first letter he received from her, in which she assured him that if he was in any want of money, quote, all her jewels were at his service. They frequently had quarrels, and more than once on coming home I have found Lady C. walking in the garden, and waiting for me to beg that I would reconcile them. When she met Byron at a party, she would always, if possible, return home from it in his carriage, and accompanied by him. I recollect particularly their returning to town together from Holland House. But such was the insanity of her passion for Byron, that sometimes, when not invited to a party where he was to be, she would wait for him in the street till it was over. One night, after a great party at Devonshire House, to which Lady Caroline had not been invited, I saw her, yes, saw her, talking to Byron with half of her body thrust into the carriage which he had just entered. In spite of all this absurdity, my firm belief is that there was nothing criminal between them. Byron was at last sick of her, when their intimacy was at an end, and while she was living in the country, she burned very solemnly, on a sort of funeral pyre, transcripts of all the letters which she had received from Byron, and a copy of a miniature, his portrait, which he had presented to her. Several girls from the neighbourhood, whom she addressed in white garments, dancing round the pile, and singing a song which she had written for the occasion, Burn, Fire, Burn, etc., she was mad, and her family allowed her to do whatever she chose. Latterly, I believe, Byron never dined with Lady B, for it was one of his fancies or affectations that, quote, he could not endure to see women eat. I recollect that he once refused to meet Madame de Stahl at my house at dinner, but came in the evening. And when I have asked him to dinner without mentioning what company I was to have, he would write me a note to inquire, quote, if I had invited any women. Wilkes's daughter may have had a right to burn her father's memoirs, but Moore, I conceive, was not justified in giving his consent to the burning of Byron's. 
when byron told him that he might quote, do whatever he pleased with them byron certainly never contemplated their being burned if moore had made me his confidant in the business i should have protested warmly against the destruction of the memoirs but he chose luttrell probably because he thought him the more fashionable man and luttrell who cared nothing about the matter readily voted that they should be put into the fire there were i understand some gross things in that manuscript but i read only a portion of it and did not light upon them i remember that it contained this anecdote on his marriage night byron suddenly started out of his first sleep a taper which burned in the room was casting a ruddy glare through the crimson curtains of the bed and he could not help exclaiming in a voice so loud that he awakened lady b good god i am surely in hell my latest intercourse with byron was in italy we travelled some time together and if there was any scenery particularly well worth seeing he generally contrived that we should pass through it in the dark as we were crossing the apennines he told me that he had left an order in his will that allegra the child who soon after died his daughter by miss c should never be taught the english language you know that allegra was buried at harrow but probably you have not heard that the body was sent over to england in two packages that no one might suspect what it was about the same time he said that being at last assured that the celebrated critique on his early poems in the edinburgh review was written by lord brougham quote, if ever i return to england brougham shall hear from me he added that critique cost me three bottles of claret to raise his spirits after reading it one day during dinner at pisa when shelley and trelawney were with us byron chose to run down shakespeare for whom he like sheridan either had or pretended to have little admiration i said nothing but shelley immediately took up the defence of the great poet and conducted it in his usual meek yet resolute manner unmoved by the rude things with which byron interrupted him that's all very well for an atheist etc Parenthesis before meeting shelley in italy i had seen him only once it was at my own house in st james's place where he called upon me introducing himself to request the loan of some money which he wished to present to lee hunt and he offered me a bond for it having numerous claims upon me at that time i was obliged to refuse the loan both in appearance and in manners shelley was the perfect gentleman End parenthesis. that same day after dinner i walked in the garden with byron at the window of a neighbouring house was a young woman holding a child in her arms byron nodded to her with a smile and then turning to me said that child is mine in the evening we that is byron shelley trelawney and i rode out from pisa to a farm a podere and there a pistol was put into my hand for shooting at mark a favourite amusement of byron but i declined trying my skill at it the farmkeeper's daughter was very pretty and had her arms covered with bracelets the gift of byron who did not fail to let me know that she was one of his many loves i went with him to see the campo santo at pisa it was shown to us by a man who had two handsome daughters byron told me that he had in vain paid his addresses to the elder daughter but that he was on the most intimate terms with the other probably there was not one syllable of truth in all this for he always had the weakness of wishing to be thought much worse than he really was byron like sir walter scott was without any feeling for the fine arts he accompanied me to the pitti palace at florence but soon growing tired of looking at the pictures he sat down in a corner and when i called out to him what a noble andrea del sato 
the only answer i received was his muttering a passage from the vicar of wakefield upon asking how he had been taught the art of the conoscente so very suddenly etc when he and hobhouse were standing before the parthenon the latter said well this is surely very grand byron replied very like the mansion house at this time we generally had a regular quarrel every night and he would abuse me through thick and thin raking up all the stories he had heard which he thought most likely to mortify me how i had behaved with great cruelty to murphy refusing to assist him in his distress etc etc but next morning he would shake me kindly by both hands and we were excellent friends again when i parted from him in italy never to meet him more a good many persons were looking on anxious to catch a glimpse of the famous lord the lines in the third canto of child harold about the ball given by the duchess of richmond at brussels the night before the battle of waterloo etc are very striking the duchess told me that she had a list of her company and that after the battle she added dead to the names of those who had fallen the number being fearful mrs barbold once observed to me that she thought byron wrote best when he wrote about the sea or swimming there is a great deal of incorrect and hasty writing in byron's works but it is overlooked in this age of hasty readers for instance i stood in venice on the bridge of size a palace and a prison on each hand he meant to say that on one hand was a palace and on the other a prison and what think you of and dashest him again to earth there let him lay end of section seventeen Section 18 of Reminiscences and Table Talk of Samuel Rogers. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Mr. Blank's house, the Blank, is very splendid. It contains a quantity of ormolu. Now I like to have a kettle in my bedroom to heat a little water if necessary, but I can't get a kettle at the Blank, though there is a quantity of ormolu lady dash says that when she is at the blank she is obliged to have her clothes unpacked three times a day for there are no chests of drawers though there is a quantity of ormolu the letters i receive from people of both sexes people whom i never heard of asking me for money either as a gift or as a loan are really innumerable Here's one from a student at Durham requesting me to lend him ninety pounds. How modest to stop short of the hundred. I lately had a begging epistle from a lady who assured me that she used formerly to take evening walks with me in the park. Of course I did not answer it. A day or two after I had a second letter from her beginning. Unkind one. Uvedale Price once chose to stay so long at my house that I began to think he would never go away, so I one day ingeniously said to him, You must not leave me before the end of next week. If you insist on going after that, you may, but certainly not before. And at the end of the week he did go. He was a most elegant letter-writer, and his son had some intention of collecting and publishing his correspondence. Not long before Mrs. Inchbald died, I met her walking near Charing Cross. She told me that she had been calling on several old friends, but had seen none of them, some being really not at home and others denying themselves to her. I called, she said, on Mrs. Siddons. I knew she was at home, yet I was not admitted. She was in such low spirits that she even shed tears. I begged her to turn with me and take a quiet dinner at St. James's Place, but she refused. 
I have heard Crabbe describe his mingled feelings of hope and fear as he stood on London Bridge when he first came up to town to try his fortune in the literary world. The situation of domestic chaplain in a great family is generally a miserable one. What slights and mortifications attend it? Crabbe had his share of such troubles in the Duke of Rutland's family, and I well remember that at a London evening party where the old Duchess of Rutland was present, he had a violent struggle with his feelings before he could prevail on himself to go up and pay his respects to her. Crabbe, after his literary reputation had been established, was staying for a few days at the old Hummins, but he was known to the people in the coffee-room and to the waiters merely as a Mr. Crabbe. One forenoon, when he had gone out, a gentleman called on him, and while expressing his regret at not finding him at home, happened to let drop the information that Mr. Crabbe was the celebrated poet. The next time that Crabbe entered the coffee-room, he was perfectly astonished at the sensation which he caused. The company were all eagerness to look at him, the waiters all a viciousness to serve him. Crabbe's early poetry is by far the best as to finish. The conclusion of the library is charmingly written. Go on, then, son of vision. Still pursue thy airy dreams. The world is dreaming, too. Ambition's lofty views, the pomp of state, the pride of wealth, the splendours of the great, stripped of their mask, their cares and troubles known, a vision's far less happy than thy own. Go on, and while the sons of care complain, be wisely gay and innocently vain. While serious souls are by their fears undone, blow sportive bladders in the beamy sun and call them worlds, and bid the greatest show more radiant colours in their worlds below. Then, as they break, the slaves of care reprove and tell them such are all the toys they love. I asked him why he did not compose his later verses with equal care. He answered, because my reputation is already made. When he afterwards told me that he never produced more than forty verses a day, I said that he had better do as I do, stint himself to four. There is a familiarity in some parts of his tales which makes one smile, and yet it is by no means unpleasing. For example, letters were sent when franks could be procured, and when they could not, silence was endured. Footnote, the frank courtship. Crabbe used often to repeat with praise this couplet from Prior's Solomon. Abra was ready ere I called her name, and though I called another, Abra came. It is somewhere cited by Sir Walter Scott, and I apprehend that Crabbe made it known to him. Other statesmen besides Sir Robert Peel have had very violent things said against them in the House. Lord North once complained in a speech of, quote, the brutal language which Colonel Barre had used towards him. General Tarleton, not indeed in the House, but in private among his own party, said that, quote, he was glad to see Fox's legs swelled. Sir Robert Peel, in one of his communicative moods, told me that when he was a boy his father used to say to him, Bob, you dog, if you are not Prime Minister some day I'll disinherit you. I mentioned this to Sir Robert's sister, Mrs. Dawson, who assured me that she had often heard her father use those very words. It is curious how fashion changes pronunciation. In my youth, everybody said Lunnon, not London. Fox said Lunnon to the last, and so did Crow. The now fashionable pronunciation of several words is, to me at least, very offensive. 
contemplate is bad enough, but balcony makes me sick. When George Coleman brought out his iron chest, he had not the civility to offer Godwin a box or even to send him an order for admission, though the play was dramatised from Caleb Williams. Of this Godwin spoke with great bitterness. Godwin was generally reckoned a disagreeable man, but I must say that I did not consider him such. Ah, the fate of my old acquaintance, Lady Salisbury. The very morning of the day on which the catastrophe occurred, I quitted Hatfield, and I then shook her by the hand, that hand which was so soon to be a cinder. In the evening, after she had been dressed for dinner, her maid left her to go to tea. She was then writing letters, and it is supposed that having stooped down her head, for she was very short-sighted, the flame of the candle caught her headdress. Strange enough, but we had all remarked the day before that Lady Salisbury seemed most unusually depressed in spirits. Her eyes, as is generally the case with short-sighted persons, were so good that she could read without spectacles. Being very deaf, she would often read when in company, and as she was a bad sleeper, she would sometimes read nearly the whole night. Madame de Stael one day said to me, How sorry I am for Campbell. His poverty so unsettles his mind that he cannot write. I replied, Why does he not take the situation of a clerk? He could then compose verses during his leisure hours. This answer was reckoned very cruel, both by Madame de Stael and Mackintosh, but there was really kindness as well as truth in it. When literature is the sole business of life, it becomes a drudgery. When we are able to resort to it only at certain hours, it is a charming relaxation. In my earlier years, I was a banker's clerk, obliged to be at my desk every day from ten till five o'clock, and I never shall forget the delight with which on returning home I used to read and write during the evening. There are some of Campbell's lyrics which will never die. His pleasures of hope is no great favourite with me. The feeling throughout his Gertrude is very beautiful, and one line describing Gertrude's eyes is exquisite those eyes that seem to love whatever they looked upon. But that poem has passages which are monstrously incorrect. Can anything be worse in expression than, O oh, love, in such a wilderness as this, where transport and security entwine, here is the empire of thy perfect bliss, and here thou art indeed a god divine. I cannot forgive Goethe for certain things in his Faust and Wilhelm Meister. The man who appeals to the worst part of my nature commits a great offence. The talking openly of their own merits is a, quote, magnanimity peculiar to foreigners. Do you remember the angry surprise which Lamartine expresses at Lady Hester Stanhope's never having heard of him? Of him? a person so celebrated over all the world. Lamartine is a man of genius, but very affected. Talleyrand, when in London, invited me to meet him, and placed me beside him at dinner. I asked him, Are you acquainted with Beranger? No, he wished to be introduced to me, but I declined it. I would go, said I, a league to see him. This was nearly all our conversation. He did not choose to talk. In short, he was so disagreeable that some days after, both Talleyrand and the Duchess de Dino apologised to me for his ill-breeding. At present, new plays seem hardly to be regarded as literature. People may go to see them acted, but no one thinks of reading them. During the run of Paul Pry, 
I happened to be at a dinner party where everybody was talking about it. That is about Liston's performance of the hero. I asked first one person, then another, and then another, who was the author of it. Not a man or woman in the company knew that it was written by Poole. When people have had misunderstandings with each other and are anxious to be again on good terms, they ought never to make attempts at reconciliation by means of letters. They should see each other. Sir Walter Scott quarrelled with Lady Rosslyn, in consequence, I believe, of some expressions he had used about Fox. If Scott, said she, instead of writing to me on the subject, had only paid me a visit, I must have forgiven him. There had been for some time a coolness between Lord Durham and myself, and I was not a little annoyed to find I was to sit next to him at one of the Royal Academy dinners. I requested the stewards to change my place at the table, but it was too late to make any alteration. We sat down. Lord Durham took no notice of me. At last I said to him, Will your lordship do me the honour of drinking a glass of wine with me? He answered, Certainly, on condition that you will come and dine with me soon. Lord Grenville has more than once said to me at Dropmore, What a frightful mistake it was to send such a person as Lord Castlereagh to the Congress of Vienna, a man who was so ignorant that he did not know the map of Europe, and who could be won over to make any concessions by only being asked to breakfast with the Emperor. Castlereagh's education had been sadly neglected, but he possessed considerable talents and was very amiable. Castlereagh, ignorant to the last, with no principle or feeling, right or wrong. Before he spoke, he would collect what he could on the subject, but never spoke above the level of a newspaper. He had three things in his favour, tact, good humour, and courage. Liverpool, indolent in the extreme, would note the Earl of Liverpool was then, 1825, Prime Minister, has no speaker on his side. If the Chancellor, Lord Eldon, spoke, it is generally to oppose him. End of section 18. Section 19 of Reminiscences and Table Talk of Samuel Rogers. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. I don't call Robinson Crusoe and Gulliver's Travels novels. They stand quite unrivalled for invention among all prose fictions. When I was at Banbury, I happened to observe in the churchyard several inscriptions to the memory of persons named Gulliver, and on my return home, looking into Gulliver's Travels, I found to my surprise that the said inscriptions are mentioned there as a confirmation of Mr. Gulliver's statement that, quote, his family came from Oxfordshire. Bowles, like most other poets, was greatly depressed by the harsh criticisms of the reviewers. I advised him not to mind them, and eventually, following my advice, he became a much happier man. I suggested to him the subject of the missionary, and he was to dedicate it to me. He, however, dedicated it to a noble lord, who never either by word or letter acknowledged the dedication. Bolz's nervous timidity is the most ridiculous thing imaginable. Being passionately fond of music, he came to London expressly to attend the last commemoration of a handel. After going into the abbey, he observed that the door was closed. Immediately he ran to the doorkeeper, exclaiming, What, am I to be shut up here? And out he went, before he had heard a single note. I once bought a stall ticket for him that he might accompany me to the opera. But just as he was stepping into the carriage, he said, Dear me, your horses seem uncommonly frisky, and he stayed at home. I never, said he, 
had but one watch, and I lost it the very first day I wore it. Mrs. Bowles whispered to me, and if he got another today, he would lose it as quickly. Major Price was a great favourite with George the Third, and ventured to say anything to him. They were walking together in the grounds at Windsor Castle when the following dialogue took place. I shall certainly, said the king, order this tree to be cut down. If it is cut down, your majesty will have destroyed the finest tree about the castle. Really, it is surprising that people constantly oppose my wishes. Permit me to observe that if your majesty will not allow people to speak, you will never hear the truth. Well, Price, I believe you are right. When the Duke of Clarence, William the Fourth, was a very young man, he happened to be dining at the equerry's table. Among the company was Major Price. The Duke told one of his facetious stories. Excellent, said Price. I wish I could believe it. If you say that again, Price, cried the Duke, I'll send this claret at your head. Price did say it again. Accordingly, the claret came, and it was returned. I had this from Lord St. Helens, who was one of the party. Once, when in company with William the Fourth, I quite forgot that it is against all etiquette to ask a sovereign about his health. And on his saying to me, Mr. Rogers, I hope you are well, I replied, Very well, I thank your majesty. I trust that your majesty is quite well also. Never was a king in greater confusion. He didn't know where to look, and stammered out, Yes, yes, only a little rheumatism. I have several times breakfasted with the princesses at Buckingham House. The Queen, Charlotte, always breakfasted with the King, but she would join us afterwards and read the newspapers to us, or converse very agreeably. Dining one day with the Princess of Wales, Queen Caroline, I heard her say that on her first arrival in this country she could speak only one word of English. Soon after I mentioned that circumstance to a large party, and a discussion arose what English word would be most useful for a person to know, supposing that person's knowledge of the language must be limited to a single word. The greater number of the company fixed on yes. But Lady Charlotte Lindsay said that she should prefer no, because, though yes never meant no, no very often meant yes. The princess was very good-natured and agreeable. She once sent to me at four o'clock in the afternoon to say that she was coming to sup with me that night. I returned word that I should feel highly honoured by her coming, but that unfortunately it was too late to make up a party to meet her. She came, however, bringing with her Sir William Drummond. One night, after dining with her at Kensington Palace, I was sitting in the carriage waiting for Sir Henry Englefield to accompany me to town, when a sentinel, at about twenty yards' distance from me, was struck dead by a flash of lightning. I never beheld anything like that flash. It was a body of flame in the centre of which were quivering zigzag fires such as artists put into the hand of Jupiter, and after being visible for a moment it seemed to explode. I immediately returned to the hall of the palace, where I found the servants standing in terror with their faces against the wall. I was to dine on a certain day with the Princess of Wales at Kensington, and thinking that Ward, Lord Dudley, would be of the party, I wrote to him proposing that we should go together. His answer was, Dear Rogers, I am not invited. The fact is, when I died there last, I made several rather free jokes, and the princess, taking me perhaps for a clergyman, has not asked me back again. One night at Kensington I had the princess for my partner in a country dance of fourteen couple. I exerted myself to the utmost, but not quite to her satisfaction, for she kept calling out to me, Feet! Feet! 
she was fond of going to public places incog one forenoon she sent me a note to say that she wished me to accompany her that evening to the theatre but i had an engagement which i did not choose to give up and declined accompanying her she took offence at this and our intercourse was broken off till we met in italy i was at an inn about a stage from milan when i saw queen caroline's carriages in the courtyard i kept myself quite close and drew down the blinds of the sitting-room but the good-natured queen found out that i was there and coming to my window knocked on it with her knuckles in a moment we were the best friends possible and there as afterwards in other parts of italy i dined and spent the day with her indeed i once travelled during a whole night in the same carriage with her and lady charlotte campbell in the shortness of her majesty's legs not allowing her to rest them on the seat opposite she wheeled herself round and very coolly placed them on the lap of lady charlotte who was sitting next to her i remember brighton before the pavilion was built and in those days i have seen the prince of wales drinking tea in a public room of what was then the chief inn just as other people did at a great party given by henry hope in cavendish square lady jersey said she had something particular to tell me so not to be interrupted we went into the gallery as we were walking along it we met the prince of wales who on seeing lady jersey stopped for a moment and then drawing himself up marched past her with a look of the utmost disdain lady jersey returned the look to the full and as soon as the prince was gone said to me with a smile didn't i do it well i was taking a drive with lady jersey in her carriage when i expressed with great sincerity my regret at being unmarried saying that if i had a wife i should have somebody to care about me pray mr rogers said lady j how could you be sure that your wife would not care more about somebody else than about you i was staying at lord bathurst's when he had to communicate to the prince regent the death of the princess charlotte the circumstances were these lord bathurst was suddenly roused in the middle of the night by the arrival of a messenger to inform him that the princess was dead after a short consultation with his family lord bathurst went to the duke of york and his royal highness having immediately dressed himself they proceeded together to carlton house on reaching it they asked to see sir benjamin bloomfield and telling him what had occurred they begged him to convey the melancholy tidings to the prince regent he firmly refused to do so they then begged sir benjamin to inform the prince that they requested to see him on a matter of great importance a message was brought back by sir benjamin that the prince already knew all they had to tell him namely that the princess had been delivered and that the child was dead and that he declined seeing them at present they again by means of sir benjamin urged their request and were at last admitted into the prince's chamber he was sitting up in bed and as soon as they entered he repeated what he had previously said by message that he already knew all they had to tell him etc lord bathurst then communicated the fatal result of the princess's confinement on hearing it the prince regent struck his forehead violently with both his hands and fell forward into the arms of the duke of york among other exclamations which this intelligence drew from him was what will become of that poor man prince leopold yet only six or seven hours had elapsed when he was busily arranging all the pageantry for his daughter's funeral the duchess of buckingham told me that when george the fourth slept at stow in the state bedchamber which has a good deal of ebony furniture it was lighted up with a vast number of wax candles which were kept burning the whole night nobody i imagine except a king has any liking for a state bedchamber 
I was at Cassia Brie with a large party when a gentleman arrived to whom Lord Essex said, I must put you in the state bedroom, as it is the only one unoccupied. The gentleman, rather than sleep in it, took up his quarters at the inn. One day, when George the Fourth was talking about his useful exploits, he mentioned with particular satisfaction that he had made a body of troops charge down the Devil's Dyke near Brighton. Upon which the Duke of Wellington merely observed to him, Very steep, sir. I was told by the Duchess Countess of Sutherland what Sir Henry Halford had told her, that when George the Fourth was very near his end, he said to him, Pray, Sir Henry, keep these women from me, alluding to certain ladies. End of section 19「20 of Reminiscences and Table Talk of Samuel Rogers」This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. I'll tell you an anecdote of Napoleon which I had from Talleyrand. Napoleon, said T, was at Boulogne with the army of England when he received intelligence that the Austrians under Mack were at Ulm. If it had been mine to place them, exclaimed Napoleon, I should have placed them there. In a moment, the army was on the march, and he at Paris. I attended him to Strasbourg. We were there at the house of the Préfet, and no one in the room but ourselves, when Napoleon was suddenly seized with a fit, foaming at the mouth. He cried, Ferme la porte! and then lay senseless on the floor. I bolted the door. Presently Berthier knocked. On the peut pas entrer. Afterwards the Empress knocked, to whom I addressed the same words. Now, what a situation would mine have been if Napoleon had died? But he recovered in about half an hour. Next morning by daybreak he was in his carriage, and within sixty hours the Austrian army had capitulated. I repeated the anecdote to Lucien Bonaparte, who listened with great sang-froid. Did you ever hear this before? Never. But many great men have been subject to fits, for instance, Julius Caesar. My brother on another occasion had an attack of the same kind, but that and he smiled, was after being defeated. Footnote, an allusion to an adventure with an actress. On my asking Talleyrand if Napoleon was really married to Josephine, he replied, Pas tout à fait. I asked him which was the best portrait of Napoleon. He said, That which represents him at Malmaison. It is by Isabelle. The marble bust of Napoleon by Canova, which I gave to A. Baring, is an excellent likeness. Did Napoleon shave himself? I inquired. Yes, answered Talleyrand, but very slowly and conversing during the operation. He used to say that kings by birth were shaved by others, but that he who has made himself roi shaves himself. To my question whether the dispatch which Napoleon published on his retreat from Moscow was written by Napoleon himself, Talleyrand replied, By himself, certainly. Readers note Talleyrand speaks. When I arrived at Paris on my return to France, footnote Talleyrand returned to France from America about 1796, Madame de Stal was very anxious to serve me and I was introduced by her to Barras, who gave me an invitation to his country house near Maili. I arrived there very early in the day, and was sitting there alone, when two young men entered the room and began a discussion, saying, Shall we go, or shall we not? At last they cried, Allons! And away they went. Not long afterwards there was great distress in the house, 
they had gone to bathe in the Seine, and one of them, a natural son of Barras, had been drowned. Barras was inconsolable, and all my endeavours to console him, such as they were, for I returned with him in his carriage to Paris, were of no avail. But they gave him such an impression in my favour that he rendered me every service he could afterwards and as long as he lived. He introduced me to Napoleon, and I came into office almost immediately. He always spoke of my kindness on that occasion with a warmth that affected me. Sillez was the first man in the revolution, le premier homme dans la révolution. To him, indeed, we owe it entirely. He it was who accomplished these three measures, the abolition of the three estates, the enrolment of the National Guard, and the division of France into departments. I was walking one day with him in the champs elysees when an officer of the Marais Chaussée overset a poor woman's basket containing les plaisirs des dames, wafers. This can never be, said he, when the National Guard is established. Recorded March the 22nd, 1833 at Lord Holland's. From an unknown correspondent. One day things had been going wrong, and Talleyrand came out of the Emperor's room much irritated, when a man about the court who squinted badly attacked him with, Eh bien, Monsieur le Prince, comment vont les affaires? Talleyrand replied, Comme vous voyez, monsieur. In answer to Madame de Stael, who asked him if she and another lady, noted for her beauty, were both in danger of drowning, which would he help first? Vous savez nager, je crois. Talleyrand to Bob Smith on his praising the beauty of his mother. C'était donc votre qui n'était pas si bien. I have committed one mistake in life, Talleyrand. Et quand finira-t-elle? I suffer the torments of hell, Talleyrand. Déjà? Talleyrand. Charles the Tenth requested the last Pope to absolve him from his coronation oath and was refused. He requested the present Pope and was absolved. Pozzo di Borgo. Talleyrand is still alive and will continue to live. Pasque de diable on a peur. The Duke of Wellington to Samuel Rogers. When Lord Londonderry attacked Talleyrand in Parliament and I defended him, saying, in everything as far as I had observed, he had always been fair and honest. Talleyrand burst into tears, saying, Il est le seul homme qui ait jamais dit du bien de moi. Dr. Lawrence assured me that Burke shortened his life by the frequent use of emetics. Quote, he was always tickling his throat with a feather. He complained of an oppression at his chest, which he fancied emetics would remove. Malone, than whom no one was more intimate with Burke, persisted to the last in saying that if Junius's letters were not written by Burke, they were at least written by some person who had received great assistance from Burke in composing them, and he was strongly inclined to fix the authorship of them upon Dyer. Burke had a great friendship for Dyer, whom he considered to be a man of transcendent abilities, and it was reported that upon Dyer's death, Burke secured and suppressed all the papers which he had left behind him. I once dined at Dilly's, in company with Woodfall, who then declared in the most positive terms that he did not know who Junius was. A story appeared in the newspapers that an unknown individual had died at Marlborough, and that in consequence of his desire expressed just before his death, the word Junius had been placed over his grave. Now, Sir James Mackintosh and I, happening to be at Marlborough, resolved to inquire into the truth of this story. 
we accordingly went into the shop of a bookseller a respectable-looking old man with a velvet cap and asked him what he knew about it i have heard said he that a person was buried here with that inscription on his grave but i have not seen it he then called out to his daughter what do you know about it nan i have heard replied nan that there is such a grave but i have not seen it we next applied to the sexton and his answer was i have heard of such a grave but i have not seen it nor did we see it you may be sure though we took the trouble of going into the churchyard my own impression is that the letters of junius were written by sir philip francis in a speech which i once heard him deliver at the mansion house concerning the partition of poland i had a striking proof that francis possessed no ordinary powers of eloquence i was one day conversing with lady holland in her dressing-room when sir philip francis was announced now she said i will ask him if he is junius i was about to withdraw but she insisted on my staying sir philip entered and soon after he was seated she put the question to him his answer was madam do you mean to insult me and he went on to say that when he was a younger man people would not have ventured to charge him with being the author of those letters when lady holland wanted to get rid of a fop she used to say i beg your pardon but i wish you would sit a little further off there is something on your handkerchief which i don't quite like when any gentleman to her great annoyance was standing with his back close to the chimney-piece she would call out have the goodness sir to stir the fire her delight was to conquer all difficulties that might oppose her will near tunbridge there is or at least there was a house which no stranger was allowed to see lady holland never ceased till she got permission to inspect it and through it she marched in triumph taking a train of people with her even her maid when she and lord holland were at naples murat and his queen used to have certain evenings appointed for receiving persons of distinction lady holland would not go to those royal parties at last murat who was always anxious to conciliate the english government gave a concert expressly in honour of lady holland and she had the gratification of sitting at that concert between murat and the queen when no doubt she applied to them her screw that is she fairly asked them about everything which she wished to know by the by murat and his queen were extremely civil to me the queen once talked to me about the pleasures of memory i often met murat when he was on horseback and he would invariably call out to me rising in his stirrups eh bien monsieur êtes-vous inspiré aujourd'hui lord holland never ventured to ask any one to dinner not even me whom he had known so long and so intimately without previously consulting lady h shortly before his death i called at holland house and found only lady h within as i was coming out i met lord holland who said well do you return to dinner i answered no i have not been invited perhaps this deference to lady h was not to be regretted for lord holland was so hospitable and good-natured that had he been left to himself he would have had a crowd at his table daily what a disgusting thing is the fagging at our great schools when lord holland was a schoolboy he was forced as a fag to toast bread with his fingers for the breakfast of another boy lord h's mother sent him a toasting fork his fagger broke it over his head and still compelled him to prepare the toast in the old way in consequence of this process his fingers suffered so much that they always retained a withered appearance 
Lord Holland persisted in saying that pictures gave him more pain than pleasure. He also hated music, yet in some respects he had a very good ear, for he was a capital mimic. End of section 20「Section 21 of Reminiscences and Table Talk of Samuel Rogers. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. I was one day not a little surprised at being told by Moore that in consequence of the article on his poems in the Edinburgh Review, he had called out Geoffrey, who at that time was in London. He asked me to lend him a pair of pistols. I said, and truly, that I had none. Moore then went to William Spencer to borrow pistols, and to talk to him about the duel, and Spencer, who was delighted with this confidence, did not fail to blab the matter to Lord Fincastle, and also, I believe, to some women of rank. I was at Spencer's house in the forenoon, anxious to learn the issue of the duel, when a messenger arrived with the tidings that Moore and Geoffrey were in custody, and with the request from Moore that Spencer would bail him. Spencer did not seem much inclined to do so, remarking that he could not well go out, for it was already twelve o'clock, and he had to be dressed by four. So I went to Bow Street and bailed Moore. The question now was whether Moore and Geoffrey should still fight or not. I secretly consulted General Fitzpatrick, who gave it as his decided opinion that Mr. Geoffrey was not called upon to accept a second challenge, insinuating, of course, that Moore was bound to send one. I took care not to divulge what the General had said, and the poet and the critic were eventually reconciled by means of Horner and myself. They shook hands with each other in the garden behind my house. So heartily has Moore repented of having published Little's poems, that I have seen him shed tears, tears of deep contrition, when we were talking of them. Young ladies read his Lala Rook, without being aware, I presume, of the grossness of the veiled prophet. These lines by Mr. Snade are amusing enough. Lala Rook is a naughty book by Tommy Moore, who has written four, each warmer than the former, so the most recent is the least decent. Moore borrowed from me Lord Thurlow's poems, and forthwith wrote that ill-natured article on them in the Edinburgh Review. It made me angry, for Lord Thurlow, with all his eccentricity, was a man of genius, but the public chose to laugh at him and Moore, who always follows the world's opinion, of course did so too. I like Lord Thurlow's verses on Sydney. Moore once said to me, I am much fonder of reading works in prose than in verse. I replied I should have known so from your writings, and I meant the words as a compliment. His best poems are quite original. Moore is a very worthy man, but not a little improvident. His excellent wife contrives to maintain the whole family on a guinea a week, and he, when in London, thinks nothing of drawing away that sum weekly on hackney coaches and gloves. I said to him, you must have made ten thousand pounds by your musical publications. He replied, more than that. In short, he has received for his various works nearly thirty thousand pounds. When, owing to the state of his affairs, he found it necessary to retire for a while, I advised him to make Holyrood House his refuge. There he could have lived cheaply and comfortably, with permission to walk about unmolested every Sunday, when he might have dined with Walter Scott or Geoffrey. But he would go to Paris and there he spent about a thousand a year. 
at the time when moore was struggling with his grief for the loss of his children he said to me what a wonderful man that shakespeare is how perfectly i now feel the truth of his words and if i laugh at any mortal thing tis that i may not weep i happened to repeat to mrs n what moore had said upon which she observed well, the passage is not shakespeare's but byron's and sure enough we found it in don juan another lady who was present having declared that she did not understand it i said i will give you an illustration of it a friend of mine was chiding his daughter she laughed now continued the father you make matters worse by laughing she then burst into tears exclaiming if i do not laugh i must cry moore has now taken to an amusement which is very well suited to the fifth act of life he plays cribbage every night with mrs moore in the memoir of carey by his son coleridge is said to have first become acquainted with carey's dante when he met the translator at littlehampton but that is a mistake moore mentioned the work to me with great admiration i mentioned it to wordsworth and he to coleridge who had never heard of it till then and who forthwith read it on the resignation of baber chief librarian at the british museum i wrote a letter to the archbishop of canterbury urging carey's claim to fill the vacant place the archbishop replied that his only reason for not giving Carey his vote was the unfortunate circumstance of Carey's having been more than once, in consequence of domestic calamities, afflicted with temporary alienation of mind. I had quite forgotten this, and I immediately wrote again to the Archbishop, saying I now agreed with him concerning Carey's unfitness for the situation. I also, as delicately as I could, touched on the subject to Carey himself, telling him that the place was not suited for him. After another gentleman had been appointed Baber's succession, the trustees of the museum recommended Carey to the government for a pension, which they seem resolved not to grant, and I made more than one earnest application to them in his behalf at last lord melbourne sent lord e to me with a message that there was very little money to dispose of but that carey should have one hundred pounds per annum i replied that it was so small a sum that i did not choose to mention the offer to carey and that as soon as sir robert peel came into office i should apply to him for a larger sum with confident hopes of better success lord melbourne then let me know that Carey should have two hundred pounds a year, which I accepted for him. Carey never forgave me for my conduct in the museum business, and never afterwards called upon me. But I met him one day in the park, when he said much to his credit, considering his decided political opinions, that he was better pleased to receive two hundred pounds a year from Lord Melbourne, than double the sum from sir robert peel visiting lady blank one day i made inquiries about her sister she is now staying with me answered lady blank but she is unwell in consequence of a fright which she got on her way from richmond to london at that time omnibuses were great rarities and while miss was coming to town the footman, observing an omnibus approach, and thinking that she might like to see it, suddenly called in at the carriage window, "'Ma'am, the omnibus!' Miss Blank, being unacquainted with the term, and not sure but that an omnibus might be a wild beast escaped from the zoological gardens, was thrown into a dreadful state of agitation by the announcement. Words cannot do justice to theodore hook's talent for improvisation it was perfectly wonderful he was one day sitting at the pianoforte singing an extempore song as fluently as if he had had the words and music before him when moore happened to look into the room 
and Hooke instantly introduced a long parenthesis. And here's Mr. Moore peeping in at the door, etc. The last time I saw Hooke was in the lobby of Lord Canterbury's house after a large evening party there. He was walking up and down, singing with great gravity, to the astonishment of the footman, Shepherds, I have lost my hat. When Erskine was made Lord Chancellor, Lady Holland never rested till she prevailed upon him to give Sidney Smith a living. Smith went to thank him for the appointment. Ah, oh, said Erskine, don't thank me, Mr. Smith. I gave you the living because Lady Holland insisted on my doing so. And if she had desired me to give it to the devil, he must have had it. At one time, when I gave a dinner, I used to have candles placed all round the dining room, and high up, in order to show off the pictures. I asked Smith how he liked that plan. Not at all, he replied. Above there is a blaze of light, and below nothing but darkness and gnashing of teeth. He said that blank was so fond of contradiction that he would throw up the window in the middle of the night and contradict the watchman who was calling the hour. When his physician advised him to take a walk upon an empty stomach, Smith asked, Upon whose? Lady Cork, said Smith, was once so moved by a charity sermon that she begged me to lend her a guinea for her contribution. I did so. She never repaid me, and spent it on herself. He said that his idea of heaven was eating foie gras to the sound of trumpets. I had a very odd dream last night, said he. I dreamed that there were thirty-nine muses and nine articles, and my head is still quite confused about them. Smith said, the Bishop of Blank is so like Judas that I now firmly believe in the apostolical succession. Witty as Smith was, I have seen him at my own house absolutely overpowered by the superior facetiousness of William Banks. End of section 21「Section 22 of Reminiscences and Table Talk of Samuel Rogers. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Speaking to me of Bonaparte, the Duke of Wellington remarked that in one respect he was superior to all the generals who had ever existed. Was it, I said, in the management and skilful arrangement of his troops? No, answered the Duke, it was in his power of concentrating such vast masses of men, a most important point in the art of war. Bonaparte, in my opinion, committed one of his greatest errors when he meddled with Spain, for the animosity of the people was unconquerable, and it was almost impossible to get us out of that corner. I have often said it would be his ruin, though I might not live to see it. A conqueror like a cannonball must go on if he rebounds his career is over bonaparte was certainly as clever a man as ever lived but he appears to me to have wanted sense on many occasions at one time i expected him there in spain in person and him by himself I should have regarded at least as an accession of forty thousand men. Clausel was the best general employed against me there. He gave me a great deal of trouble, for every night he took a good position, and every morning I had to turn and dislodge him. Once I thought I had him. But it pleased a young gentleman of ours to go and dine at a cabaret in the valley a mile or so off. Clausel's reconnoitring party fell in with him, and Clausel took the alarm and was gone. 
he was then a young man and is now eighteen twenty four in disgrace and in america if there was a war we should hear of him again in spain and also in france i used continually to go alone and reconnoitre almost up to their pickets seeing a single horseman in his cloak they disregarded me as some subaltern no french general said soult would have gone without a guard of at least a thousand men everywhere i received intelligence from the peasants and the priests the french learnt nothing at vittoria they were hourly expecting clausel with reinforcements and i was taking my measures accordingly when alava brought me an innkeeper who said make yourself easy sir he is now quietly lodged for the night in my house six leagues off so saying he returned to attend upon him and i lost no time gordon afterwards killed at waterloo passed the night in an osteria with some french officers and no sooner were they asleep than a spanish child in the room made gestures to gordon drawing the edge of his hand across his throat and why so said gordon in the morning when they were gone because i knew you to be an englishman by your sword and your spurs don't drink of that well said a spanish woman to an english soldier is it poisoned some frenchmen are there she replied and more than you can count whenever a frenchman came and looked into it she sent him in headlong the french were cruel to their guides one whom we found dead in the road had conducted them within sight of the castle they were in search of and no sooner had he pointed to it on the hill than he received a bullet from a pistol at the back of his head we found him an hour afterwards lying on his face where he fell and learnt in a neighbouring village that he had been hired there they wished to conceal their movements from us but why not detain him for a day or two we were blockading pampeluna when bonaparte sent salt from dresden to relieve it il a la meilleure tête tout pour la guerre said he and salt came with an immense army having collected all he could our blockading force was small but i knew of the intention and assembling our troops from all quarters as far as possible i rode on before them to show myself to the blockaders and also to the enemy the first received me with three shouts for they knew that i should not come alone and by the last even if not so announced i was sure to be discovered for i was almost within gunshot there was a spy in the habit of going from camp to camp we called him don uran de la rosa and he dined with us and with the french alternately who is he and what is he said alava when he saw him at table a spaniard an andalusian they replied no spaniard said alava he may be caliostro or anybody else but no spaniard he was forever talking as frenchmen are and always at my elbow he had just left the french and he said to me when i was reconnoitring do you wish to see marshal salt certainly there he is then i looked through my glass and saw him distinctly so distinctly as to know him instantly when i met him afterwards in paris as i did several times though never to exchange ten words with him he was sitting on his horse and writing a dispatch on his hat while an aide-de-camp waited for him to whom when he had done he delivered it pointing with much earnestness in one direction again and again i see enough i replied and gave the glass to another saying to him observe which way that gentleman goes he galloped off as directed and i knew at once as i thought where the attack was to be made 
that is my weakest point said i to myself and i prepared accordingly of such use as i had always maintained are glasses he sort looked much lustier than now and just as his son does now i beat him thoroughly the next day or the day after and drove him back into france i should have done still more but for an accident a trooper or two of his fell in with some stragglers of ours and snatching them up behind him galloped off to the camp that salt might gather from them what he could the name of this fellow the spy was ozi latterly i would not let him come near me and had him always observed so he could not shift his quarters when i was ambassador at paris he came and begged me to make interest with salt for the settlement of his accounts how can i i said laughing when we made such use of you as we did they were settled however if we could believe him after his death the frenchman came to me in london and when he had vapoured away for some time declaring that ozi had won every battle and saved europe he said here are his memoirs shall we publish them or not i saw his drift and said do as you please you must know he was neither more nor less than a spy i heard no more of them or of him after the battle of toulouse i went to paris and was on my return to the army when soult and i met half way each of us had six horses to his carriage and the postilions as usual stopped on the road to change i was fast asleep and knew nothing of the matter but soult learning from my courier who i was came to the front of my carriage as i was afterwards told and during the operation observed me through his glass as i lay there at paris i knew him immediately though i had only seen him through mine Messena, i remember was at the same dinner and said to me vous m'avez rendu les cheveux gris when Massena was opposed to me, and in the field, I never slept comfortably. Soult was much affected by appearances. Once, before the Battle of the Pyrenees, when I was preparing for action, our men happened to shout. And I said, Soult will not come out today. Nor did he, for he thought we had received some great reinforcement. Whether Soult at his age, March 1831, would now serve in case of a war, I cannot say. He is a great man in the administration of war, but less in battle, less in what are called les stratagèmes de la guerre. In the Battle of the Pyrenees he made many desperate attacks, but I was everywhere prepared for him. Marmont throws the fault on others but i think he was to blame at salamanca for he spread his army thinking that we wished to make off and with my whole force i made a sudden attack on his centre in front and in rear it was said and said truly that we defeated forty thousand men in forty minutes he was however a very excellent officer in spain i never marched the troops long twenty-five miles were the utmost they set off usually at five or six in the morning and took their ground by one in india they could go further once in one day i marched them seventy-two miles starting at three in the morning they went twenty-five miles and halted at noon then i made them lie down to sleep setting sentinels over them and at eight they started again marching till one at noon the next day when we were in the enemy's camp in europe we cannot do so much for in england we send them by a canal into the interior and along the coast by a smack in india they must walk i look upon it that all men require two pounds weight of food a day the english not more than the french 
vegetable food is less convenient than animal food the last walking with you the elastic woven corslet would answer well over the cuirass it saved me i think it ought this where i was hit on the hip i was never struck but on that occasion and there i was not wounded i was on horseback again the same day in spain i shaved myself overnight and usually slept five or six hours sometimes indeed only three or four and sometimes only two in india i never undressed it is not the custom there and for many years in the peninsula i undressed very seldom never for the first four years english horses are the best of all for military service the mares are better than geldings they endure more fatigue and recover from it sooner war in spain is much less of an evil than in other countries there is no property to destroy it enter a house the walls are bare there is no furniture dash when at our headquarters in spain wished to see an army and i gave directions that he should be conducted through ours when he returned he said i have seen nothing nothing but here and there little clusters of men in confusion some cooking some washing and some sleeping then you have seen an army i said i should much like to tell the truth but if i did i should be torn to pieces here or abroad i have indeed no time to write much as i might wish to do so and i am still december eighteen twenty seven too much in the world to do it there is a history of the campaign in spain of eighteen hundred and eight or nine in english with french notes that is admirable as to the french movements and was written most probably by some irishman then with soot napier has great materials and means well but he is too much influenced by anything that makes for him even by an assertion in a newspaper i do not think much of southey readers note a reference to southey's history of the peninsular war the subaltern is excellent particularly in the american expedition to new orleans he describes all he sees end of section twenty two section twenty three of reminiscences and table talk of samuel rogers this librivox recording is in the public domain the duke of wellington speaking after the battle of victoria the spaniards said you came over the english menden a basque word for a chain of hills your black prince came over them and there he fought for don pedro the cruel at that old castle he had his headquarters it agrees with the account in Frossa. f ponsonby speaking he the duke would often come into my room when he rose and converse for a few minutes but once it was during the siege of burgos he came and walked about and said nothing at last he opened the door and said as he went out cox was killed last night Waterloo. Wellington resumes the narration. When Bonaparte left Elba for France, I was at Vienna and received the news from Lord Burgess, our minister at Florence. The instant it came, I communicated it to every member of the Congress, and all laughed. The Emperor of Russia most of all. What was in your letter to His Majesty this morning? said his physician for when he broke the seal he clapped his hands and burst out laughing various were the conjectures as to whither he was gone but none would hear of france all were sure that in france he would be massacred by the people when he appeared there i remember talleyrand's words so well pour la france non bonaparte i never saw though during the battle waterloo we were once i understood within a quarter of a mile of each other 
I regret it much, for he was a most extraordinary man. To me he seems to have been at his acme at the Peace of Tilsit, and gradually to have declined afterwards. He would have done better, I think, to have stood on the defensive. Six hundred thousand men would have gathered round him, and the jostling of so many would have been terrible. If he had waited for his moment, and attacked when and where he pleased from the centre, his success in one instance might have been fatal to the rest. At Waterloo he had the finest army he ever commanded, and everything up to the onset must have turned out as he wished. Indeed, he could not have expected to beat the Prussians, as he did at Ligny, in four hours. But two such armies as those at Waterloo have seldom met, if I may judge from what they did on that day. It was a battle of giants, a battle of giants. Many of my troops were new, but the new fight well, though they manoeuvre ill, better perhaps than many who have fought and bled. As to the way in which some of our ensigns and lieutenants brave danger, the boys just come from school, it exceeds all belief. They ran as at cricket. Very early in the day the Nassau Brigade were shifting their ground from an orchard, and when I remonstrated with them they said in their excuse that the French were in such force near them. It was to no purpose that I pointed to our guards on the right. It would not do and so bewildered were they that they sent a few shots after me as I rode off. And with these men, I said to the corps diplomatique who were with me, and with these men I am to win the battle? They shrugged their shoulders. How did they behave in the action? Well enough, and it should be remembered that, as they had never served with us, we had not acquired their confidence. They had come over to us at Bayonne, having formed the rear guard of the French army in Spain, and knowing as they now did that Bonaparte was in the field, their dread of him must have borne some proportion to the courage with which he had formerly inspired them. I never saw the narrative of Lady de Lancy. I should like much to see it. I never saw her. I heard she went through a good deal. Delancey was with me and speaking to me when he was struck. We were on a point of land that overlooked the plain, and I had just been warned off by some soldiers, but as I saw well from it, and as two divisions were engaging below, I had said, never mind, when a ball came leaping along on ricochet, as it is called, and striking him on the back, sent him many yards over the head of his horse. He fell on his face and bounded upward and fell again. All the staff dismounted and ran to him, and when I came up to him he said, Pray tell them to leave me, and let me die in peace. I had him conveyed into the rear, and two days afterwards, when on my return from Brussels I saw him in a barn, he spoke with such strength that I said, for I had reported him among the killed, What a lancy! You will have the advantage of Sir Condy and Castle Rackrent. You will know what your friends said of you after you were dead. I hope I shall, he replied. Poor fellow. We had known each other ever since we were boys. But I had no time to be sorry. I went on with the army and never saw him again. When all was over, Blucher and I met at La Maison Rouge. It was midnight when he came, and riding up, he threw his arms round me and kissed me on both cheeks as I sat in the saddle. I was then in pursuit, and as his troops were fresh, I halted mine and left the business to him. In the day I was for some time encumbered with the corps diplomatique. They would not leave me, say what I would. We supped afterwards together between night and morning in a spacious tent erected in the valley for that purpose. Podze di Borgo was there, among others, and at my request he sent off a messenger with the news to Ghent, where Louis the Eighteenth breakfasted every morning in the bow window to the street, and where every morning the citizens assembled under it to gaze on him. When the messenger, a Russian, entered the room with the news, the king embraced him, 
and all embraced him and one another all over the house. An emissary of Rothschild was in the street, and no sooner did he see these demonstrations than he took wing for London. Not a syllable escaped from his lips at Bruges, at Ostend, or at Margate, nor till Rothschild had taken his measures on the stock exchange was the intelligence communicated to Lord Liverpool. Footnote. This statement about the operations on the stock exchange, though doubtless believed at the time, has since been declared mythical. On that day I rode Copenhagen from four in the morning till twelve at night, and when I dismounted he threw up his heels at me as he went off. If he fed, it was on the standing corn and as I sat in the saddle. He was a chestnut horse. I rode him hundreds of miles in Spain and at the Battle of Toulouse. He died blind with age. 28 years old in 1835 at Strathfield Say, where he lies buried within a ring fence. Sir Henry Hardinger's narration begins, Hardinge at Gladstone, Saturday, June the 24th, 1843. Before the Battle of Ligny, in which I lost my arm about noon, Blucher, thinking that the French were gathering more and more against him, requested I would go and solicit the Duke for some assistance. I set out, but I had not proceeded far for that purpose when I saw a party of horse coming towards me, and observing that they had short tails, I knew at once that they were English, and soon distinguished the Duke. He was on his way to the Prussian headquarters, thinking that they might want some assistance, and he instantly gave directions for a supply of cavalry. How are they forming? he inquired. In column not in line, I replied. The Prussian soldier, says Blucher, will not stand in line. Then the artillery will play upon them, and they will be beaten damnably. So they were. At the last Waterloo dinner, when my health was drunk as usual, and as usual I rose to return thanks, I stated briefly this occurrence, and the Duke, when I alluded to it, cried, Hear, hear! Note by Samuel Rogers Two days before the Battle of Waterloo, the Duke came into Lady Mornington's room at Brussels, saying, Napoleon has invaded Belgium. Order horses and wait at Antwerp for further instructions. When they were there at Antwerp, Oliver entered their room waving a bloody handkerchief, and informed her that a victory was gained, and that they must return forthwith to Brussels. She and her daughter had not been there, Brussels, half an hour when the Duke arrived, and walking up and down the apartment in a state of the greatest agitation, burst into tears, and uttered these memorable words. The next greatest misfortune to losing a battle is to gain such a victory as this. End of section 23「Reminiscences and Table Talk of Samuel Rogers」This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Miscellaneous Remarks and Anecdotes by the Duke of Wellington The French king, when he goes from chapel, speaks to everybody, and different rooms have different ranks. I have often dined with the king of the Netherlands, the northern kings admit subjects and strangers to dine with them. The Bourbons never did, I believe, at Paris, except in my instance. At Ghent, perhaps, the etiquette was departed from, but I believe I am the only person who has dined with Louis the Eighteenth at Paris. I have dined often with him. He sat at six, and when dinner was announced, was wheeled in from the room in which he had received me. The table was large, and he sat between the two ladies. I sat between Monsieur and the Duc d'Angoulême. They were waited upon by gentlemen, I by a servant, and of course best served. The dinner was exquisite. We sat down at six and rose at seven, and then all sat and talked with the king till eight, avoiding all political subjects. 
the king ate freely but mixed water with his wine which was champagne the king will not now go out in the carriage but on great occasions they have contrived a machine to lift him into it by but his indolence or his fear of the caricaturists or both keep him at home he is fond of mots and full of esprit rather than sensible and did not at first consent to read the speeches prepared for him by his ministers preferring to speak d'abondance the emperor alexander when here in eighteen fourteen treated the prince regent with no respect thinking him not half a king and kept him often waiting ministers were anxious to set him right by their behaviour and desired me to do so but lord grenville produced the greatest effect showing the prince every attention at oxford and treating the others only as his guests the old king george the third his father was no listener when fox came out of the closet once somebody said you've had a long audience given one you mean was his answer note by samuel rogers at woburn abbey and apsley house april and june eighteen twenty one the duke of wellington has naturally a great gaiety of mind he laughs at almost everything as if it served only to divert him not less remarkable is the simplicity of his manner it is perhaps rather the absence of everything like affectation in his account of himself he discovers in no instance the least vanity or conceit and he listens always readily to others his laugh is easily excited and it is very loud and long like the hoop of the hooping cough often repeated Wellington speaks at Lady Shelley's Berkeley Square, May the eighth, eighteen twenty three. Moscow, I am very sure, was burnt down by the irregularity of his Bonaparte's own soldiers. That pamphlet published by the governor of Moscow states what I am persuaded was the truth. If he had stopped and had contented himself with organising Poland and establishing Poniatowski there, it had been well for him. After his Austrian marriage, Metternich was sent to Paris to see him and to report upon his character, and to discover whether he meant to be quiet. His answer, as he told me, was in three words. He is unaltered. He had then resolved to invade Russia. Cassiobury, October the second and third, eighteen twenty four. I hear nothing by my left ear. The drum is broken, it might have been broken twenty years ago, for aught I know to the contrary. A gun discharged near me might have done it. Strange impressions come now and then after a battle, and such came to me after the Battle of Assai in India. I slept in a farmyard, and whenever I awaked, struck me that i had lost all my friends so many had i lost in that battle again and again as often as i awaked did it disturb me in the morning i inquired anxiously after one and another nor was i convinced that they were living till i saw them i speared seven or eight wild boars in a forest in picardy an eastern practice the largest struck the sole of my foot with his tusk when i thrust my lance into his spine and was turning my horse off at the instant as i always did the rest of the party set up a shout and i believe it gave me more pleasure this achievement than anything i ever did in my life lord hill killed one on foot but the difficult thing was to kill one on horseback Whoever threw the first lance into a boar claimed it as his. Never saw but one royal tiger wild, never at a tiger hunt. Elephants used always in war in India for conveyance of stores or artillery. 
i had once occasion to send my men through a river upon some a drunken soldier fell off and was carried down by the torrent till he scrambled up a rock in the middle of the stream i sent the elephant after him and with large strides he obeyed his driver when arrived he could not get near the rock and he stiffened his tail to serve as a plank the man was too drunk to avail himself of it and the elephant seized him with his trunk and notwithstanding the resistance he made and the many cuffs he gave that sensitive part placed him on his back at our bus knots over the fire sunday evening november the twenty first eighteen thirty they want me to place myself at the head of a faction but i say to them i have now served my country for forty years for twenty i have commanded her armies and for ten i have sat in the cabinet and i will not now place myself at the head of a faction when i lay down my office to-morrow i will go down into my county and do what i can to restore order and peace and in my place in parliament when i can i will approve when i cannot i will dissent but i will never agree to be the leader of a faction Footnote, this was on earl grey's accession to office on the resignation of the duke of wellington samuel rogers speaking having met lord grey again and again at my table and knowing our intimacy he meant that these words should be repeated to him and so they were word for word on that very night wellington speaks at talleyrand's march the thirteenth eighteen thirty one scott's life of napoleon is of no value the tolerable part of it is what relates to his retreat from moscow i have thought much on that subject and i have made many inquiries concerning it i gave him my papers he has used some not all wolf tone was a most extraordinary man and his history is the most curious history of those times with a hundred guineas in his pocket unknown and unrecommended he went to paris in order to overturn the british government in ireland he asked for a large force lord edward fitzgerald for a small one lord edward was for assistance only and was afraid of their control they listened to tone but when their fleet arrived in bantry bay the irish would not rise to join them then it was i believe and for that purpose that their religious feelings were worked upon and from that time the dissension was religious before it was political july the fifth eighteen thirty one in poland an army can keep the field from june till february in february the thaw begins and the rivers become impassable nor are they navigable till june in that interval too the roads are axle deep divitch began in february eighteen thirty one urged on probably by the emperor and failing in his first attempt was obliged to throw his troops into cantonments these the poles attacked with a terrible slaughter divitch must have lost there above thirty thousand men the russians will now i think settle the matter and yet a revolutionary war is the most difficult to manage of any military tactics are there of little service the poles i think have no chance if the russian army is true and it is only when in their quarters that troops grow mutinous and desert not in the field bonaparte began his campaign there in poland in june when he fought the battle that ended in the peace of tilsit he was slow in paris but swift enough when he took the field apsley house march the first eighteen thirty two a tax on the transfer of stock was three times proposed to me from cambridge by a professor i sent them the clause in the act of parliament against it and heard no more of it at my house friday june the twenty second eighteen thirty two 
on june the eighteenth eighteen thirty two monday i rode to pastrucci in the mint he had made a bust of me but wished for another sitting so i went without giving him notice on that day at nine o'clock and mounted my horse at half-past ten to leave him when i found a crowd at the gate and several groaned and hooted some cried bonaparte for ever i rode on at a gentle pace but they followed me soon a magistrate ballantyne came and offered his services i thanked him but said i thought i should get on very well the noise increased and two old soldiers chelsea pensioners came up to me one of them said he had served under me for many a day and i said to him then keep close to me now and i told them to walk on each side and whenever we stopped to place themselves each with his back against the flank of my horse not long afterwards i saw a policeman making off and i knew it must be to the next station for assistance i sent one of my pensioners after him and presently we got another policeman we then did pretty well till i reached lincoln's inn where i had to call at an attorney's chambers smalls sugden and many others came out of the chancery court to accompany me and a large reinforcement of police came from bow street the conduct of the citizens affected me not a little many came out of the shops to ask me in many ladies in their carriages were in tears and many waved their handkerchiefs from the windows and pointed downwards to ask me in i came up hoban by the advice of a man in a red cape at first i thought it might be a snare but i found him to be a city marshal i was forty minutes in coming from the mint to lincoln's inn a young man in a buggy did me great service flanking me for some time and never looking towards me for any notice ellis's hotel march the twentieth eighteen thirty eight the french in algeria should have done as we have done in india they should have respected everywhere private property and the customs and habits of the people they have introduced a system of spoliation and plunder that sets every man against them a system that is now too strong to be checked by the government at home they parcel out the land planting wheat where there was rice and changing the face of the country the soldiers too i suspect are not what they were what is that rara avis common sense it is i believe a good understanding moderated and modulated by a good heart samuel rogers as he said these words his voice dropped and i never knew him speak with more feeling july the twenty first eighteen thirty eight clausel made no mistake at constantine the failure was occasioned by the badness of his army he could not depend upon his officers they were so worthless a set at lord wilton's june the fifth eighteen forty the chinese show more sense and knowledge than i thought they possessed they reason well and they fight our ships better than i thought they would but of this i am sure we must make them sensible of our power they are now constructing vast gongs and preparing to frighten us with terrifying noises the portuguese ordered their soldiers to attack us with ferocious countenances november twenty fourth eighteen forty i was on my way to fontainebleau with charles the tenth then monsieur and the duke of fitz james when passing in the carriage through the street in which henry the fourth had been assassinated and charles pointed out to me the very place where according to tradition it had happened charles spoke of him with great admiration and dwelt much on his merit in changing his religion for the good of his country contrasting his conduct with that of james the second fitz james of course took the part of his ancestor and long was the argument while i sat still leaving the combatants to themselves 
at last they came to the same opinion agreeing that henry was right in becoming a catholic and james in continuing one had caesar's commentaries with me in india and learnt much from them fortifying my camp every night as he did i passed over the rivers as he did by means of baskets and boats of basket work only i think i improved upon him constructing them into bridges and always fortifying them and leaving them guarded to return by them if necessary told me by a bus knot at beckett's downing street november the fourteenth eighteen twenty six samuel rogers he the duke had a high idea of moore's talents lieutenant-general sir john moore k b and always said that all he wanted was practice in the command of a large body of troops at the treaty of sintra he said to moore you and i moore are now the only men and if you are to command i am ready to serve under you samuel rogers speaking walking some years ago about eighteen thirty eight or eighteen thirty nine through the park with the duke of wellington i said to him among other things what an array there is in the house of commons against lord john russell peel stanley graham etc wellington lord john is a host in himself it was in vain that the duke of wellington said you must not cross the indus for sure as you are to conquer you can nowhere establish yourselves we crossed it and go where we would disaster followed us wherever we went yet never to the last has he suffered the least allusion to it in parliament were the subject to be revived it would lessen us he says in the eyes of all europe and when sir james graham gave notice of a motion concerning it he sent his friend arbuthnot to say to him you must not make it of the duke's perfect coolness on the most trying occasions colonel gurwood gave me this instance he was once in great danger of being drowned at sea it was bedtime when the captain of the vessel came to him and said it will soon be all over with us very well answered the duke then i shall not take off my boots end of section twenty four end of reminiscences and table talk of samuel rogers